yes uh good evening and uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, professor oliver uh this is in fact uh, our 35th uh, session uh into the new year we started in may uh, the association of uh, asia scholars and uh, we have been holding uh, weekly webinars on issues of uh, interest not only to scholars in asia but globally and um, our association of asia scholars just to uh, introduce uh, our uh, society as it's a registered society since 2005 we have been engaged uh, in bringing together scholars um, intellectuals experts uh, from all over the world and we have been having uh, several international conferences focusing more on asia and we have over a dozen publications uh, which are a, a result of our conferences held since 2005 and uh, we have completed 11 years of our flagship publication which is uh, millennial asia a journal with sage uh, publishers so 11 years uh, into the journal and it's a triannual journal now and um, through our association we are also Uh, connecting with all the alumni of the Asian Scholarship Foundation, 300 plus scholars who are now, um, you know, at different uh, universities, different think tanks and institutions, and doing well for themselves. Because this was over the period 2000 to 2010 that um, you know the Asian Scholarship Foundation actually granted scholarships to. Uh, fellows in asian countries to live and study in an asian country for 9 months so that is how you know we have come together as a family and we have continued uh, to interact not only among ourselves but also to uh, bring several uh, eminent uh, speakers like yourself to our conferences and webinars and we have been using this lockdown time very fruitfully because we have had the opportunity of listening to very very eminent scholars who may not have had the time to fly down to new delhi to actually have a face to face interaction due to their very very busy and hectic schedules we also hosted uh, online uh, a very important international conference on revisiting gandhi peace justice and development and we are working on the publication of those papers as a volume uh and hopefully by next month uh, we would be submitting the manuscript and then april we have another conference uh, lined up already for 9th and 10th that is on multilateralism in the indo pacific so with these words i hand over to professor swaran singh to formally introduce our speaker for today and all the work that he has done and the theme on which he is going to be speaking to so thank you all for joining us and really looking forward to listening to our eminent speaker for today thank you thank you professor rina marwa uh, it's a delight to have a friend uh, online face to face if not in real face to face Uh, but all of you possibly read in uh, newspapers or saw on television that this weekend something unusual took place uh, you are familiar with a, a name uh, sir richard branson uh, who is uh, the owner of uh, virgin atlantic airlines and several other initiatives uh, he is usually painted and presented as a very adventurous uh, entrepreneur but also very adventurous individual himself now this weekend he used one of uh, his old the uh, 747 uh, jumbo jets civilian aircraft to successfully launch 10 satellites shoebox size satellites this is first time that such an experiment took place and was successful we have all heard and seen uh, of uh, fighter aircraft launching missiles 
or rockets launching satellites from ground their various space centers elon musk is for example another private entrepreneur who is launching satellites uh, called spacex series for the first time a civilian aircraft goes up to 35000 feet up in the sky and launches rockets from there to successfully place in the orbit that was uh, meant to be its orbit for 10 small satellites what we have noticed is a kind of unusual race for capturing the real estate in outer space there are several tens of uh, satellites being launched every day into space which will be potentially rented out to you know companies uh, or companies or governments who may use those uh, satellites uh, floating up in various orbits around earth we are going to face a, a very unusual future not too far into you know within this decade possibly uh, several people talk about how internet connectivity will become like oxygen that we breathe so when i land let us say in sao paulo i don't have to ask my friend oliver stoinkel for a password for oxygen i just start breathing right and internet within this decade will become like the air we breathe which you can do any part of this planet now that is uh, throwing up challenges that uh, makes several experts present very very complex uh, even sometimes doomsday scenarios so saying you know we are going to be slaves to robots but within that space is also the politics so it's not pure pursuit of science that we talk of it's also how pursuit of science is conceptualized operationalized and delivered in terms of commercialization and massification of new science within that we have noticed last four years of trump administration a constant technology war intellectual property has constantly been an irritant in china's relations with the united states and that is where we are noticing an enormous amount of politics of unfolding of technologies and how they will be made available your everyday reading how 5g has become a major issue how huawei's uh, senior executive is held in vancouver for over a year now and united states i will request people to keep mute and how united states is trying to you know get extradition of the senior official of away she is daughter of the owner actually so politics of it i think is also going to determine and that is the link that perhaps today's speaker is going to explain to us how the technology wars that are both shaping and are being shaped by the emerging world order and i think for such an interesting subject now we could not have thought of a better speaker than i can take some liberty with my old friend uh, oliver in describing him a restless and curious intellectual he is so productive at least i'm sure i have missed half of his works that he does but i'm aware of about at least nine books that he has produced and forget his uh, media appearances and writings and the journal articles and chapters so that's why i i you know almost treat him like my younger brother and then i have liberty i take liberty to describe him as a restless intellectual who's able to then look into these various unfolding of new technologies uh, and describe that technology war he's currently uh, based in a very very prestigious uh, university it's called getulio 
Vargas Foundation, which is uh, normally described or addressed as GVF, the foundation in Sao Paulo in, in Brazil, but he's an international player in that sense. So he's into various other institutions. Uh, among others, for example, he's a non-resident fellow currently at the Global Public Policy Initiative in Berlin. Among some of the books that I think are relevant for today's discussion, of course, one I have already put on your banner that perhaps you can see uh, is on the post-Western world. Uh, two other books, I think, which describe him as a scholar with grounding on global south, uh, from where he is perhaps looking at how world order is evolving, is his book on IBSA, which is IBSA, India, Brazil, South Africa, The Rise of Global South. That is a very interesting book. If you have interest in looking at global perspectives from a Brazilian intellectual, I think you should uh, definitely find an access to that book. And other one is on BRICS and the future of world order. And these three books, I think, are, are definitely the, the, the leg of foundations of possibly his next focus now, uh, which is on the emerging uh, technology wars and how they are shaping the world order. And I myself am very curious to listen to him because uh, we become less curious and restless as you start growing in age as I do. So I look forward to listening to uh, a very, very productive scholar like uh, Professor Oliver Strinkle to speak to us on this very interesting subject. Uh, before I uh, close my initial remarks and invite uh, Oliver to make his uh, presentation, I usually uh, request participants to please switch on your videos uh, so that we can feel that we are in the same room. And the, the speaker will have a sense of speaking to you know, sort of participants uh, and, and they are still, you know, old fashioned, at least I'm old fashioned. I like to see people who I'm speaking to. Uh, so uh, I would uh, urge participants to keep their videos on and their microphones off so that uh, we can really enjoy the presentation by Professor Stinkel today. Uh, with those uh, remarks, I will request Professor Stinkel to now begin with his initial remarks uh, on the subject. Oliver. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'd like to, to thank the Association of Asia Scholars, uh, Secretary General Professor uh, Dina Marva and Swaran, a great friend. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be, to be back uh, in, in Delhi, at least virtually. Uh, I, I've known Swaran for, for many, many years. I've had uh, uh, the privilege to, to spend time at, uh, at JNU uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it's, been, it's been quite a while, but I have extremely fond memories of spending two Januaries uh, in, in Delhi, uh, which is quite a difference from, from Brazil. We're in the midst of, uh, of the summertime. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's the hottest month of, of the year. And, uh, but in, in these periods in, in the winter in, in India were really quite, uh, quite amazing, an opportunity to speak with uh, a large number of, of scholars. Uh, and I do hope to be back uh, once the pandemic, pandemic, the end of the pandemic makes travel uh, possible again. Uh, as as Svaran uh, mentioned here, I, uh, I'm fascinated by uh, studies on the global south. I think that there is so much that um, is, is possible to, you know, to learn, uh, you know, by bringing together scholars from Latin America, from South Asia, uh, you know, from, from Africa. Uh, and I must say, you know, uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, IR theory, when thinking about uh, the future of global order, uh, it has often been in discussions with, uh, among scholars of the global south that, uh, that I have learned most. Uh, the asymmetries when it comes to, you know, visibility of, of contributions uh, is still a reality as it was uh, 10 years ago, but I think it's much less the case uh, than, than before. I think uh, the world has not only become much more multipolar uh, when it comes to, to economic and military power, uh, but it has also become, 
I think, a much more fascinating place uh, when it comes to uh, intellectual production. And I, uh, I have here in, in Brazil uh, promoted strongly uh, the study of uh, production of intellectual production uh, across uh, the global south. Um, I've uh, you know studied and discussed many contributions by by Indian scholars, by scholars from other Asian countries, and I think that this is something which uh, is is really a lifelong passion of mine, and something that uh, it has been very gratifying to see how we've been able to establish. Uh, ties uh, and you know this is always a, a process that's non linear uh, so the, the creation of IPSA and the BRICS uh, I think was a very significant step in the right direction uh, it continues to be relevant particularly BRICS I think uh, IPSA and I must uh, actually blame my uh, own government here uh, and uh, has not I think fully com you know understood sort of the, the significance uh, and the uh, you know the, the potential gains uh, that uh, engaging in, uh, in, uh, in IPSA provides, uh, but I'm certain that this will reemerge in the next years. Uh, and I think it's in a way almost heartening that despite uh, significant uh, you know changes in member countries, the BRICS grouping continues to to operate. I spoke uh, last month to the uh, president of the BRICS Bank. Um, and you know, the more institutional ties there exist, uh, the better these uh, the, the discussions between governments uh, of BRICS countries also can uh, can deepen. So um, this is why I'm I'm particularly happy to uh, to discuss uh, uh, my current research uh, with you. But I'd like to to emphasize that uh, I I will uh, speak a lot about questions that I have, uh, not about uh, solutions or answers. This is in no way an attempt to provide a definitive uh, solutions to some of these very complex issues that we're facing right now, but very much a way to, to share with you, um, uh, you know, some ideas of how to think about uh, the emergence of this, uh, you know, uh, competition, uh, this battle for digital supremacy, and what it uh, means for the future of, of global order, and how we as international relations scholars can contribute to helping policymakers, for example, making sense of that, and how uh, the, the perspective of seeing this competition from Brazil is different or similar than, for example, looking at it uh, from a, an Indian uh, perspective. Uh, I, um, I'd like to just very briefly say here uh, the, the, that uh, uh, last year, uh, Brazil's president, uh, uh, upon uh, being elected, uh, uh, no, I'm, we're already in 2022, uh, 2021, so it was two years ago. In 2019, the President Bolsonaro, he uh, made his first trip to the White House, and um, uh, he is, pro projects himself to be a Trump of the tropics. Uh, so uh, he uh, sat down with President Trump and said, uh, what can we do uh, to uh, you know, make sure that the United States perceives us to be uh, a key ally, uh, you know, because we really would like to make uh, rapprochement with the United States uh, our a signature issue because we truly believe in this partnership, something unheard of in the history of Brazilian uh, foreign policy. And Trump or his advisors, as I've uh, been told by people I've interviewed of this meeting, said, you know, uh, there's really one thing that we're most interested in. Uh, we'd like to make sure that you don't allow Huawei uh, to build the 5G network uh, in Brazil. It's the uh, sixth uh, largest country, uh, most populous country in the world. It used to be number five. We've just been overtaken by Pakistan. Uh, but, you know, it's still a very important market uh, when it comes to uh, 5G technology. And that really struck the Brazilian delegation somewhat by surprise. And uh, Bolsonaro and his foreign minister returned to Brazil and initiated, um, you know, an assessment of, uh, of 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 the meaning of you know of, of of 5G in the context of Brazil's foreign policy, of the costs that were involved, and very soon this topic, which seems to be only a niche topic, uh, very technological, very complex, became an, an issue of national debate, 
And people from across the ideological spectrum began discussing this and saying, you know, we cannot do this because banning uh, Huawei is, um, you know, it would be seen as a hostile act by the government in Beijing. Um, and above all, it's against something very basic that uh, this government stands for, which is the promotion of free trade and globalization, right? Uh, this government was elected um, by, uh, you know, by saying we need to end this very long trajectory of uh, being protectionist. We finally want to open up. So uh, banning a company based on the country where it's from doesn't, you know, goes contrary to these, to these aspects. Then you had the military weighing in and saying, you know, uh, this is an issue of, of national sovereignty. We shouldn't look at the price of the construction of the 5G network. But we should really, considering that how many parts of the economy will be based on the 5G technology, uh, you know, banking, education, health, transport, and even defense, uh, will very much be embedded in the 5G technology. We cannot allow a country to um, you know, build this uh, technology that, that we don't fully trust. Uh, and then, of course, a big debate ensued about why should we trust the United States any more than we trust China, considering that in the long history of uh, Latin America-U.S. relations, uh, you know, the intervention, U.S. intervention, meddling in Latin American affairs has been one of the hallmarks of, uh, of Latin American, uh, uh, you know, history, a uh, very traumatic history of the United States uh, considering Latin America as its backyard where it could engage freely. So the, a debate surged of uh, that, you know, China perhaps, having China provide uh, the Huawei's, you know, the, having Huawei provide the 5G technology may be a way to balance the United States, something that Brazil has always wanted in a way, being uncomfortable with the asymmetry of power that has shaped, uh, uh, you know, political dynamics in the Western Hemisphere, right? The, the, the continuous concern that the United States may to some extent, be interested in not necessarily physically occupying, but certainly controlling uh, political events in Latin America and limiting Brazil's capacity to engage. And in a way, the creation of IPSA, the creation of the BRICS grouping, was very much a way to um, diversify partnerships and to be able to engage with others as a means to not wholly depend on the United States. And I thought that was you know, so fascinating to follow this debate because you suddenly had a very difficult, very complex issue where you need to talk to a lot of, you know, uh, specialists uh, uh, in technology uh, who do, usually don't really know much about uh, international relations. We don't know, you know, about technology. These things are, are difficult for us to understand. Uh, and you suddenly have this uh, debate, which was no longer about ultra-fast mobile communication, but which was about um, you know, globalization, it was about geopolitics, it was about national sovereignty, uh, and it was also about ideology. It was a, a question of, you know, in this debate, which uh, is, is at first sight uh, is very, very technical, you know, this, this, this uh, clash and this battle for, for digital supremacy between uh, Washington and, and Beijing seems at first sight to be extremely different from the Cold War in the 20th century because, as you know, you hear quite a lot, uh, Yan Xue Tong, for example, from China keeps saying this. He says, this is not a, an ideological contest, right? Because China doesn't want to export communism. Um, the United States is still sort of interested in exporting democracy, but it's really not about, it's not a systemic battle because anybody who uh, you know, takes flight to Shanghai or to, to Beijing will quickly realize that, you know, this is not the Soviet Union. This is a country that is very, uh, you know, different in it, the way that it seeks to engage uh, in the capitalist structures of the world. This is a country that's, you know, is, is not uh, uh, describing capitalism as this uh, root of all evil. So we can sort of engage in a much better way. Uh, and apart from that, of course, we have all these uh, economic ties between the great superpowers, which makes uh, a, a genuine clash in the style of the 20th century um, impossible. Uh, yet, 
when we look at the discussions of you know the future of internet governance, and that also uh, you know emerged in Brazil, um, where people asked, well, you know, we were very uncomfortable with the tradition of U.S. meddling, even spying. We recently had a big spy, an NSA scandal when the United States um, spied on our president, the uh, President Rousseff and Petrobras, uh, the you know the state oil company, and we. We are, you know, unhappy about that, but we fundamentally agree with the sort of Western, quote unquote, or U.S. argument that the internet should be a free space, and that you know governments shouldn't, you know, there, there shouldn't be a, 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 a you know, governments uh, separating the internet. Uh, you know that there was a lot of people who were who were saying that, and sort of saying, you know, based on that, um, maybe we shouldn't allow uh, the Chinese to build. Uh, uh, our our 5G network. So you suddenly had a huge number of issues that make it very very difficult, I think, for us to think about this in a structured way because it's very hard to compare, for example, concerns about the cost of building this new technology for Brazil. And it, I, I really I, I find it. I think my what I'm most interested in, and that's why you know. Uh, I really, India would like to be one of the first places I visit for, the, for this research, because I know that there's such an, an interesting debate going on in India, which of course I'm not so aware of. Um, uh, you know, the, um, th there's a debate about uh, the dramatic cost of you know, building this, but also the perception that uh, the 5G, the rival of 5G provides tremendous opportunities for uh, uh, Brazil to catch up. Uh, to catch up in a way that um, I think India has caught up already, uh, but Brazil is still behind uh, when it comes to really adapting to a uh, digital world economy, a country that uh, you know has huge problems to modernize and digitize its economy, uh, but which could benefit tremendously from it. For example, uh, in, in, in interviews I've spoken to. Um, uh, you know the CEOs of big uh, agricultural uh, companies that are the backbone of uh, of Brazil's economy, and they said, you know, we're ex very excited about 5G because we have farms uh, that are so large that to supervise and to to see all our farms, we take the airplane every day uh, because you cannot take the car; it's just too large. You know, these are you know hundreds of of kilometers. And uh, we will use drones that uh, will uh, monitor the uh, the speed of growth of you know soy or our plants. Uh, so these drones can then, on, from then on, they can also fertilize and decide which areas require fertilization, which don't. So 5G could be a revolution uh, for Brazil's economy, uh, even though it's a, an economy that's very much based on agriculture and not on services. Uh, like uh, like the Indian economy, uh, so there's this immediate cost concern, but there's also this concern about you know does the fact that we side with one side um, make us part of a sphere of influence, a technological sphere of influence that we don't want to be part of? In this sense, Brazil is very similar to India, um, very allergic to. Um, alliances that tie us down. Uh, you know, Brazil is, uh, you know, one of the mantras that has, um, you know, really sort of shaped the way Brazil thinks about its place in global order is strategic autonomy. You know, autonomy is really the key. Uh, we don't, at no, at no point, want to depend on, you know, uh, on and somebody else we cannot control. So uh, you know, this is really a key aspect. And there's been long, long debates, whereas, uh, you know, India um, has, uh, you know, decided not to join the, the NPT. In Brazil, there was a decision in the 90s to accept uh, the NPT, be part of the NPT, uh, which by, you know, some uh, uh, analysts, particularly in the military, was criticized because we're saying, you know, we need to maintain our autonomy. So the at least the option of having nuclear weapons, for example, uh, should be open to us. Um, and just that to describe that I think there is a lot of questions here to be asked of 
once this tech war advances, uh, how, what is the nature of the spheres of influence that will emerge, which are no longer dependent on geography, right? Uh, that whereas uh, during the Cold War, um, you had blocks that were geographically, uh, geographically connected, you could in theory have technological spheres of influence that are based on which technology is being used to, for example, uh, build uh, 5G technology. Uh, but I'm only using 5G technology here as an example because there's many other aspects and many other standards that uh, will be the result of this clash between China and the United States or you know, even third countries like India or the European Union uh, on issues like uh, quantum uh, computing like uh, artificial technology, but I think the 5G technology gives us a first sense of where this is going and where, for example, you could have Latin America fractured uh, in several spheres of influence where, for example, Brazil decides uh, to ban Huawei and thus be part of a sort of Western uh, sphere of influence because it you know, has excluded Huawei and Argentina uh, accepting Huawei technology and basically developing technologically in a different direction and not necessarily allowing these spheres of influence to be compatible, right? And, and this, uh, um, I think, leads me to a, a key question of whether the key concept uh, or one of the key elements that has um, been at the center of the characteristics of the global order over the past 30 years, which is, despite all the limitations, a push by the United States to reduce uh, trade barriers, right, to, to, to promote globalization, which is probably now ending because the United States uh, public no longer supports that. I think we have a much more protectionist uh, wave coming but um, where this uh, opening up is now giving rise to a new um, situation in which uh, the, you know, there's a, a bit of a, a geopoliticization of, of globalization and where concerns about national sovereignty because of the rise of the tech war um, will, make, will uh, uh, create barriers that uh, make countries less willing to promote the opening up but actually consider technology firms, for example, to be national assets that need to be protected. Uh, and in the battle for these technological standards, uh, where the risk emerges that uh, you know, these different spheres of influence will make being neutral, which is something that uh, Brazil would actually like. There's a lot of talk of strategic neutrality, which I find a bit of a, a, a it's a bit funny because um, in, in Brazil sometimes, you know, somebody says, well, we need to, uh, we need this response, let's try to be uh, neutral, but it needs to sound good, so let's add strategic. Uh, you know, let's, let's be strategic, <laughs> strategic neutrality. But it's really unclear what that means, uh, in part because uh, the, the question arises, is it possible to be neutral um, in, a, in a world in which you know, sitting on the fence once these technologies uh, need to be adopted and there's a lot of pressure uh, being exerted on these countries is so, no longer possible. That's why I think the case of India is so interesting, uh, right? So uh, where, where India is seeking, and this has become a really interesting point of debate, uh, why Brazil is not doing something like India. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's impossible, of course, because uh, in developing sort of a domestic technology and not really making a choice uh, is something that you need to plan many, many years uh, you know, in, into the past. You need to have the, uh, you know, the capacity of you know, IT knowledge, et cetera, that, uh, that Brazil lacks. Um, so, but despite that, the consensus amongst Brazilian uh, policymakers right now is that strategic neutrality is the way forward. Uh, but it may, I think, not be possible. And I'd just like to quote here, uh, two years ago, uh, in, the, in September 2019, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, wrote in his, um, in his annual report uh, that he feared the possibility of a great fracture, the world splitting in two with the two largest economies on earth, creating two separate and competing worlds, each with their dominant currency 
uh, trade in the financial rules, their own internet and artificial intelligence capacities, and their own zero-sum geopolitical and military strategies, right? So uh, I think based on uh, this assessment, you know, uh, there is a, a lot of um, differences, obviously, that, uh, that emerge in this new scenario when we compare it to a previous great power competition. Uh, but at the same time, um, and, and we need to have, I think, this debate, to what extent the peril, the historical peril, is useful, or if it actually um, makes a difficult uh, or a complex debate even more difficult because it uh, brings all the uh, uh, you know, problems with it that uh, you know, using the term new Cold War obviously uh, implies. But it has become, uh, a, I think, uh, an issue that it has been, that's been too, too important uh, to ignore, uh, and which I think is unlikely to go away, even if, for example, the new government uh, the, in the United States, which uh, uh, is, is coming to power uh, today, will moderate its approach to vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis China. I think my expectation would be that, you know, th there, there will be a different rhetoric, perhaps something a bit less aggressive, uh, but it certainly will continue uh, the general uh, posture, which now has become a consensus in Washington, that containing China is crucial that China is a systemic competitor. Uh, and I think perhaps many of you may have made that same experience. I've participated in several conferences over the past year in China, uh, where, for example, it was not uncommon uh, to see um, US scholars, which were invited to not receive visa, and the same in the United States, where you know there was a debate within and Chinese scholars had been invited, and uh, you know the Chinese didn't uh, receive their their visas on time. And I think uh, um, I've uh, over the past months um, uh, interviewed several uh, scholars uh, who work on China issues, and there is a marked uh, decline in students who are uh, you know willing to major in China studies. So I think. What we're also seeing is a genuine uh, a, a gap emerging, a reduction in the uh, uh, cultural and academic cooperation uh, between those major countries, which I think will make uh, engagement later on more difficult and which will create for third countries like India and uh, Brazil uh, a more difficult scenario in which having it both ways uh, will be far more difficult than I think the majority of policymakers uh, imagines uh, right now. We're sort of, you know, maintain somehow uh, being in the middle uh, continues to be uh, the de a desired outcome, but uh, which in practice may be extremely difficult. And Brazil will have to make its decision about 5G uh, this year, um, and it will have to do something which it doesn't like, which is to. Uh, you know, be on sort of worse terms with uh, one side uh, because it's just, in, in that sense, uh, unavoidable. Um, so um, I, uh, I think there's, but I think I'll leave that for the, for the discussion. I think there's a, a number of issues that are a part of this debate. One is, for example, uh, you know, the future of, of governance, of how uh, considering this um, you know, return of geopolitics and great power competition in a, very, in a technological sphere, um, how governance, global governance, um, can play a role, uh, whether a world data organization or a general agreement on data and digital infrastructure, for example, or some digital Geneva Convention uh, can help address uh, uh, data-related challenges uh, that, you know, states can no longer solve on their own. Um, and if it's true that, as, uh, as a, a EU official uh, has told me, that you know, it's, it's hard to align rules on products uh, uh, that already exist, but it's fairly easy uh, to do so uh, in emerging, uh, uh, on emerging technologies, which creates, of course, a vast uh, advantage to countries like India, which do have the knowledge, and a tremendous challenge for countries 
where the knowledge on technology on 5G is extremely limited. Uh, and in that sense, I think, uh, again, India has their uh, a really important role to play in that sense. And uh, it's, again, it's decisions in the public debate in India uh, has been really fascinating from the outside uh, to, to follow uh, with, I think, many, many um, uh, potential lessons uh, for Brazil. Uh, but again, a lack of, of, of communication, in part, I think, because of the pandemic, which has uh, made it very difficult for governments to, to cooperate. But again, I think for the future, uh, a tremendous opportunity for countries which, in essence, share the same interests, which is not to antagonize with neither the United States nor China to pursue its own path um, and to also think about the potential benefits that the return of this great power competition may produce. So I'll stop here, uh, back to uh, you, Swaran, and uh, I look forward to your comments. Uh, and, you know, not necessarily questions, because I think there's so much that uh, you can say that is not really a question, but a, a more a reflection of uh, how what I said, you know, is similar to the uh, Indian debate uh, of how that, you know, strikes uh, somebody who's based in India is completely, you know, nonsensical or, you know, uh, very different. Uh, so I think that uh, would be a terrific opportunity, and not only today, but also in the future to, to discuss these, these themes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Stoenkel, for outlining a very, very interesting uh, unfolding new world order, where you mentioned even the limited the bandwidth of 5G technologies uh, is creating new spheres of influence, as you mentioned. And how, uh, like earlier world orders unfolding, some nations chose to stay neutral. Uh, you mentioned the Brazil opting for strategic neutrality. And of course, in India, the word we have is strategic autonomy. Uh, I think they are not too far away from each other in terms of what is the policy posturing that India and Brazil are planning to do here. Uh, but very interesting how even the limited the bandwidth, we are not even talking of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, all kinds of other. And then, of course, move into semiconductor, rocketry, and robots and other things. And likewise, the explosive inventions happening, for example, in biotechnology or in cyber uh, you know, space, cyber security. We are focusing, and I think he was primarily focusing on 5G technology, which is going to kind of leapfrog the connectivity in terms of how the world gets connected and how new spheres of influence uh, evolve. Uh, today, there are about 50 companies, uh, big international companies, dedicated to focusing on 5G uh, services and technologies, uh, production and dissemination. They are engaged already in about 100 nations. 100,000 experts are today employed uh, simply to deal with 5G expansion itself. And these are providers, they're not consumers. Consumers are, of course, going to be much, much bigger. In India, we recently saw the launch of uh, uh, Apple's uh, iPhone 12, which is apparently 5G, uh, you know, sort of uh, you know, operative. Uh, so in that sense, in everyday life, as well as in international world order, the way it is unfolding, uh, one can look at each of these subsets of technologies as to how they are creating new contestations uh, for all the countries. And China, of course, uh, also lies at center of it, both because of uh, the way China's, uh, again, leapfrogging of uh, various technologies uh, has taken place, primarily because of its economic prowess. We are hearing that uh, at end of 2020, China's GDP has now hit 15.5 trillion US dollars. And then it, it is really interesting how even in pandemic time, they are claiming to having, uh, you know, sort of achieved about 2.3% positive growth rate. And that is going to feed into their uh, further uh, sort of pursuits of uh, new technologies. Uh, and connectivity is very, very central to uh, the focus of their leadership. So I'm sure both at your individual level, at the level of uh, India, and of course at the level of global politics, uh, participants will have several 
questions and speaker has also welcomed comments. Uh, so we welcome even uh, comments from you. And as usual, the, the protocol is that uh, participants uh, uh, should switch on their videos and also then use electronic hands, which is normally the blue hand. If it comes on the screen, I'll be able to uh, indicate uh, you to that particular example if any one of you was to raise electronic hand. Uh, and if you're not able to use electronic hand, just raise physical hand. I guess. And in that case, of course, you have to be on my screen to be, you know, make sure that I see you and I'll invite you to make your intervention. Uh, so you could even raise hand like this if you're not able to raise uh, e-hand. I have just noticed one hand going up physically like this. Uh, Vikhyat Date is requesting for uh, making an intervention. Uh, before you make your intervention, please introduce yourself in terms of uh, your own research focus or affiliation so that the speaker will get an idea as to from where that question is coming uh, in that sense to uh, respond to uh, your comment or question. Uh, let me begin with the Vikhyat Date and meanwhile others can also you know, try to see how they can raise their electronic hand or just raise physical hand. And we will begin with Vikhyat uh, to ask the first question or make the first intervention. Yes. First of all, good evening, Oliver, sir. And it's it's the pleasure, it's pleasure of our organization to have you as the guest today. And my my question is, so as we know that in the South China Sea, uh, there is a face-off between the Quad countries and China. And even if we see a longer picture, there is a face-off going on between uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative and uh, Quad Group. As we know, then Quad Group, there are four members, India, Japan, USA, and Australia. So what is Brazil's say on it? What Brazil think about this face-off? Excellent. Uh, thank you. This is a, a terrific question. Uh, I think that um, <clears throat> I think that we're we're in a way living history because uh, I think one of the key challenges of the new uh, U.S. administration will be to uh, uh, reaffirm uh, the commitment of you know strengthening uh, its allies in Asia. Uh, a region which I think will be decisive as uh, China, uh, as it you know approaches the United States in size, or, or the, its economy, uh, as it seeks to uh, reduce at least the gap of its military, uh, you know, a, a, the difference of military power prowess compared to the United States, which by the way is a very interesting uh, issue in the context. Of the tech war, because you know, I did, this was I've made some uh, introductory remarks, but uh, I think the attempt by China is clearly to utilize the transformation and the digitization uh, of the future of conflict and uh, the transfer, the let's say the shift of uh, the use of of military power into cyberspace in order to uh, uh, leapfrog uh, several stages that it would have to go through if it were to challenge the United States conventionally, uh, which is, I think, very difficult for, for China to do. Uh, so I, I see that the, 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 the question you asked and sort of the topic you, uh, you, you approached of the South China Sea is really uh, as, as a decisive area uh, where uh, China will inevitably seek to uh, consolidate uh, its claim to regional hegemony, uh, but will inevitably clash with, uh, you know, a continued uh, presence uh, in, uh, uh, you know, geopolitical U.S. presence in Asia, which of course, you know, uh, seen closely, you much uh, more acquainted with than uh, than we are in Latin America, looking at uh, from it uh, afar. In, in general, I think, and that's a also a fascinating uh, issue that I, I mentioned initially. I think the world, um, and I, I think that's true for Latin America, also for Africa, perhaps the Middle East, is really struggling so much right now to adapt to an Asia-centric uh, world uh, because um, all the way it thinks about the world is consumes information, etc., has been shaped in a Western-centric world. 
uh, and and uh, the fact that the you know issues involving the Quad countries in China, the South China Sea, are today the decisive you know geographical spots for the future of global order, uh, require um, uh, us to adapt in a way that I think it's for many it's uh, it's very difficult. It's it means not only reading about you know the U.S. elections, etc., but understanding these issues in Asia, which again has been quite a struggle in, uh, in Brazil, the number of Asia specialists is, is very limited. Uh, I would say that uh, the way China is perceived in, in uh, Brazil is not so much in terms of, you know, uh, it's a systemic rival, et cetera, because I think in general, in Brazil's perception, the United States, um, has seen above all as a destabilizer and potential threat to uh, you know sovereignty in Latin America, which is of course different in uh, in India. For, for India, a partnership with the United States is a, help, a helpful move in order to uh, you know keep China at a distance or in order to to balance China. Uh, so in that sense, the two countries I think uh, have you know, different utilities when it comes to these uh, these trends. Um, in uh, there, there's a, a lot of debate about the extension of the Belt and Road Initiative to Latin America, um, but also a lot of concern about how uh, China's greater engagement uh, could produce similar effects to those seen in Sri Lanka, for example. Uh, this has been a, a case discussed very, very broadly in Brazil. The fact that uh, uh, you know Sri Lanka had to cede a port uh, to China, uh, and at the same time. Uh, Several governors in Brazil were negotiating big uh, credits by Chinese to, by, by China to uh, build new ports in Brazil. A lot of people said, "How can you know we avoid something like that?" Because it you know doesn't help us to escape the influence of one major power to then simply shift into a situation of dependence uh, with uh, with another. Uh, so I think that now there's an increasing uh, appreciation. Uh, of the fact that uh, this face-off that you mentioned is taking place. Uh, and I, I would say today, uh, you know, how would, let's say, Brazilian policymakers and, and, and armed forces, et cetera, relate to that, to, uh, to still opt you know, for this neutral stance, con considering the fact that China is a key ally uh, from the economic point of view, uh, but that you know, a country like India um, is extremely important. We were reminded of that uh, uh, just over the past days when the Brazilian government, in its very confused way, uh, uh, called uh, India, the Indian government, to request uh, vaccines, <laughs> and it hadn't planned it adequately. So, uh, rightly so, the Indian government said, "Well, you know, we've a long list of countries that have spoken to us." Uh, many months ago, so you know you're not necessarily amongst the first recipients of the Indian coronavirus vaccine. So I think the uh, th there is sort of that perception of of uh, of a desire to take to, to be as far as possible from these hot spots, uh, but also an unwillingness to sort of take sides as this unfolds, uh, and certainly an, an understanding that these developments will shape global order like no other. Thank you. I think that's what Thank I was you, mentioning. That's what I was mentioning of taking liberties with friends. So the Brazilian health minister announced he's sending a flight to pick up two million vials of vaccine from India. And India said, hello, we are not even prepared. We are still making list of priorities. Uh, so there are yeah. countries. Brazil very... is on the list. And India possibly will be happy to supply vaccines to Brazil anytime. But we'll go to that later. I also noticed that uh, Professor Hem Kusum has joined us. She teaches um, uh, Chinese language and literature at uh, Vishwa Bharati University in West Bengal. Uh, I'm mentioning this because Oliver is very familiar with India. So he possibly has a sense of where you teach. But before that, we already have. Before I'll come to you a little later, but we have two hands up as you can see already. Uh, that is how you make uh, e electronic hand requests. So I'll first go to uh, Prathit Singh. 
Uh, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and then ask your question or make your point. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, namaste to everyone. Uh, I'm Prathit. I'm a first year student at uh, Ramjas College, Delhi University, and an aspiring uh, researcher in the field of international relations. Uh, my, my question to you, sir, uh, is really that uh, one, one aspect that we have seen is the geopolitics part of uh, global technology, while there is another aspect which is developing in the form of uh, warfare, in the form of lethal autonomous weapon systems, where we are handling weapons in, in terms of technology, not knowing uh, that what the harms could be. And on one hand, we have countries like Germany and other countries who have altogether banned these weapons from uh, manufacturing in their land, while United States, as we have known, through its history, starting from the World War II, that it has been uh, developing it as a deterrence against uh, against the other countries, and while creating a ripple effect in that in that sense. So, uh, so where do you see uh, the future of warfare uh, in terms of uh, global technology and its development, and how some countries, uh, like the World War II, may be deprived of it, and then it creates a ripple effect? And where do we lead through that? Right. Well, um... I, I think that's uh, one of the most sort of uh, you know fascinating uh, aspects, and is, is bound to be, I think, of of great relevance. So, if you plan on uh, uh, you know emphasizing this in your studies, I'm, I'm I'm sure it will you know generate a lot of uh, a lot of interest. I'm very pessimistic uh, because I think that uh, our capacity to regulate and govern uh, these areas is so limited. Uh, and uh, as you point out, I think some countries have uh, taken measures uh, while others have not, um, and I can only, you know, if you just look at the past weeks, uh, you know, and there was a, a there's been a, a massive cyber attack uh, against the U.S. government, um, and really a remarkable ambiguity in the way that uh, the United States responded in a way, because also in part because of difference, uh, difficulty of attribution. Uh, there's very, very basic uh, issues that still need to be resolved for us to agree on a basic set of principles, which, which exists in, in, the, in the use of, 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 of conventional force, right? Uh, uh, we, we do have that. Uh, we cannot uh, ban war, but we can seek to regulate it in a way that it, that it takes place according to, you know, some uh, uh, rules uh, and norms. And I think that uh, the the technological uh, advance uh, advancements made in the area of of, of military technology, uh, the incredible universe of you know dual use dilemma uh, uh, dilemmas, which you know uh, will allow. Uh, technologies used for uh, non-military uh, uses to be, be quickly transformed, I think, uh, is has not been addressed. And I think the attempts to do so uh, are still largely limited to, you know, uh, think tanks, which are necessary in, in scholars, but uh, where I see only a very uh, limited capacity in the near term to take sort of serious, uh, you know, to, 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 for, for countries to get together and develop a global framework which will have an actual impact in part because a lot of the uh, participants uh, in this emerging conflict are non-state actors. And, you know, en engaging them, having that at the table is, is practically impossible. Uh, and in part because, um, you know, you cannot, uh, blame the Russian government necessarily for some hacker where there's no uh, direct connection necessarily, or you know maybe a connection, but not, you know difficult to prove. Uh, uh, who has you know set off a, a cyber attack against uh, against another country? So um, in, in there, I still have a lot of faith though that uh, governance mechanisms uh, can be established. Uh, they need to have certainly uh, buy-in from, they will always have to uh, have buy-in from the, the major actors. And then I, I, I worry much less about the countries that are sort of followers in that sense, like, you know, Brazil or other smaller countries which aren't in the lead of the development of these technologies. Uh, but I think that should be an, uh, one of the priorities as we seek to reimagine governance in a much more geopolitical context, right? Because uh, we, we, I think we, uh, we were able to think about governance and a lot of mitigating um, 
you know, the negative impacts of geopolitics on dealing with global issues fairly well over the past 30 years, even though we failed with climate change. But you know, there's there's platforms, and I think for these, uh, there there aren't yet the adequate platforms, which will be the biggest challenge uh, over over the next decade or, or two. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I go to the next uh, participant, or I may ask uh, Professor Hain Kusum to say something. Uh, let me say, if I have missed, your electronic hand is not working. Just raise hand like this. Uh, that's very quickly. I can see two hands are only up now. But let me invite uh, Professor Hain Kusum. You would like to say something? China keeps yeah, coming in. I think that, you know, like, it's so interesting. Like, if you... Uh, replace the names uh, like instead of Brazil, you say India. It seems uh, we have so much similar uh, concerns, you know. Like and the debate around China, like when you are dealing with a country who uh, which uh, perpetually uh, lives in a state of like they they talk of uh, hundred years of humiliation, like even even till date, uh, no. Uh, no important uh, deliberation goes without mentioning that. So is it possible not to antagonize a country like this? Um, you know, and uh, how far can we, uh, can we achieve that? That is all, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's quite interesting if we look at, and you, you of course, uh, you know, know this much, much better than I, uh, that, uh, uh, there's been a, a state-led uh, attempt uh, or campaign to promote this very narrative, uh, not only diplomatically speaking, but also internally, uh, where, you know, on Chinese television, uh, there's now lots about, you know, the opium wars and, uh, and you know, there's somewhat of a mobilization uh, preparing the uh, Chinese population about the potential costs of uh, the tensions that, uh, that are to come. Uh, and I think those are, are, are quite significant. I haven't, uh, I haven't mentioned those here uh, early on, but uh, you know, uh, um, the, uh, est there, are, there are some estimates of, of the cost uh, of this uh, tech war, which of course will have a massive impact on, on globalization, which will uh, reduce the sharing of, uh, uh, of knowledge which will make uh, cross-border investments uh, between those blocks more difficult. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time until this uh, tech war and you know, will uh, lead to uh, you know, not only an entity list which blocks technology companies, but also a, um, uh, limitations on finance, on fintechs, for example, on funds, Chinese funds that are no longer capable of uh, engaging uh, on, on financing uh, US startups and vice versa, uh, a Deutsche Bank uh, estimated here uh, that the tech war uh, until 2025 would uh, cost more than $3.5 trillion simply because it will be a much more, uh, you know, a difficult world uh, to, to uh, you know, it's, uh, it's less globalized and more impacted by political risk and geopolitical issues. And I think that China has, to some extent, is seeking to prepare, uh, you know, its population uh, build a narrative that it's, uh, you know, it has uh, a, a right to uh, right a wrong in the past and sort of that, you know, it's, it's time has come. Uh, we have this problem here in, in, in Brazil all the time. The president is promoting a narrative which, uh, to put it mildly, is very uh, has a very negative impact on Brazil's relationship to the world. He uh, antagonizes uh, foreign leaders in order to shore up domestic support, which in the short term is very popular. And people love when President Bolsonaro says, oh, you know, we are fighting against uh, Maoist China. Uh, they want to, you know, take away our, you know, our, our, our private property, etc. And, uh, and against globalist France and against leftist Argentina and against... But we've now been basically fighting with the entire world, and uh, and now you know now the supposedly quote unquote globalists are in the White House. Um, and I, what I keep telling people is, you know, foreign policymakers who say, you know, why is he doing this? And I say, well, I know it's difficult, but let's try to separate the domestic rhetoric 
from from the international one as much as as possible. And I think that in in China's case, uh, this uh, fairly aggressive uh, rhetoric, quite nationalist rhetoric, um, is clearly meant to mobilize and uh, you know unify a domestic population, which uh, needs to be prepared for the fact that uh, these good times of high growth in a world which I just described of much more limited globalization will be difficult and that growth rates will be lower and that you know that will be will be tricky but I to answer your question I'm not so sure um, to what extent the kind of cooperation we've seen over the past decades will be possible and that's why in general I'm quite pessimistic uh, because I think that once you have this kind of great power confrontation there is a possibility also of hardening, and that and that you know all kind, that the entire engagement between the two countries will be seen in a geopolitical lens. And I think there's been clear signs by the Chinese government to uh, accept decoupling this attempt to reduce the interdependence between the two, um, with again significant impact for for the world economy. So I'm I'm quite unfortunately quite pessimistic. Of, of how these this emergence, these trends that I described, will will impact uh, uh, not only um, prosperity but also the the risk of conflict, considering the, the kinds of trends within China that you described. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Oliver Stunkel is also a China hand simultaneously, so he can handle Chinese questions uh, with great no. comfort. <laughs> that all, is, uh, Robert. From a Brazilian perspective, looking to China, but uh, you know, I'm... there are uh, three more hands I can see that are up now. Uh, let me ask first uh, Ms. Barkha Dubey to unmute yourself and introduce yourself, and then ask your question or make your comment. Good evening, sir. Thank you for such an enriching talk. Uh, so I have two questions. So my first question is that uh, how do you think? I mean, what do you think is so unique and different about ITSA that uh, you know, it, it 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 is emerging as the global as it is emerging as a leader, which is giving recognition to the voice of global south now. And the second thing is, how do you see IPSA uh, in terms of defining the future of multilateralism in the coming future? Yeah, so IPSA uh, uh, IPSA emerged um, at a time when uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, uh, you know, India and Brazil in particular sort of teamed up. Uh, this was before IPSA, uh, when um, there were very similar concerns in areas of, uh, of you know, um, adjusting patents uh, in, in public health in order to, uh, to fight uh, uh, pandemics in Brazil, in particular the HIV AIDS pandemic was uh, was a massive challenge, and uh, and Brazil decided at that time uh, to team up with a series of uh, other countries, which also were quite advanced in this area, uh, to uh, gain access to uh, the medicine which was available at the time, dramatically reducing the cost and and saving uh, millions of lives uh, in the process. And uh, I think in many moments. Uh, particularly sort of uh, starting in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was an, a growing perception between policymakers in India and in Brazil and also in South Africa that, uh, you know, there was a space for democracies in the global south which were committed to multilateralism, um, which shared a lot of the ideals that were voiced, you know, by countries like um, Europe or the United States, but which also had some misgivings about uh, the hierarchy, for example, uh, in the you know U.S.-led system, uh, and uh, you know a lot of the contradictions and negative externalities uh, that were uh, being produced, uh, and that uh, there was a fundamental need to readjust existing structures uh, to allow countries you know like India, like Brazil, uh, to you know play a, more, uh, a leading role. Uh, I think for India, this remains true today. Uh, Brazil has, uh, because of its political and economic crisis starting in 2013, I think 
uh, many, you know, a lot of internal challenges which make its engagement on a global scale more difficult than that in India. And India also, I think, uh, that's a big difference between our countries as a, you know, a, a, a dupe, as I think um, a long tradition and sort of intellectual pedigree in geopolitics and particularly sort of defense and uh, that Brazil doesn't have, right? We, we haven't really, we haven't faced a sort of conventional threat uh, or, you know, for, for more than 100 years, that no uh, clearly apparent uh, uh, enemy. Uh, and what's always really quite fascinating for, for me whenever I, I travel to India is uh, that you really have a, a large amount of specialists in issues like, you know, nuclear policy, uh, you know, defense, etc., which are really niche is issues in Brazil. Um, but having said that, I think these uh, countries engaged in an unprecedented attempt to promote intra-BRICS ties um, and to join forces in particular moments when doing so would serve all their three interests. And especially after, so immediately after the uh, global financial uh, crisis, uh, the three uh, asked for greater representation in existing uh, structures like the World Bank, like the IMF, uh, uh, they could, to some extent, work together when it comes to UN Security Council reform. Even though South Africa ended up uh, you know, complicating things a bit because there's no agreement amongst African countries of who, which countries should uh, uh, represent, uh, um, you know, the continent, and whether it should be one African country or two African countries, and so that you know of, of didn't prosper. But I think the narrative that uh, countries in the global south needed to proactively engage, make proposals, is still very valid and actually had it. Always in favor of maintaining IPSA as a functioning body, separate from BRICS. Because, you know, anybody from India who will come to Brazil will recognize a lot of things, uh, right? Uh, is how, you know, there's, it's very politicized, it's a very vibrant uh, you know, democracy, extremely uh, active civil society, uh, as, as we like, as we say, you know, in, in Brazil, there's 210 million opinions, right? You, on everything, in politics, you go take a cab and people will have their views. And I think the same is actually true in, in India, right? Where uh, whoever you speak to, they're extremely uh, engaged politically and have their opinions, etc. And I, I think that there's something to be said about this, that you, there's things you can discuss at the BRICS, at an IPSA summit that you cannot necessarily discuss at a BRICS summit, uh, because uh, you know China has a, is a, it has a different political system. Uh, so, so I was always uh, in favor of, of, of maintaining this. I think that currently, uh, particularly Brazil, uh, faces a lot of internal challenges, but I hope that in the future this can reemerge as a very productive platform to think about uh, uh, reforms of the international order and how India, Brazil, and South Africa can, can make contributions in that sense. Thank you for being so patient and that's what exactly we wanted, that each participant should get this sense of having got a detailed answer to his or her question. Uh, I again saw three hands going up, but one of our participants, uh, my own student, Smita has perhaps lowered her hand or is, is it by mistake that hand got lowered, but we'll first go to uh, Sunaina Pura, who's uh, raised her hand in sequence of how hands were raised. Please introduce yourself and then make your introduction. Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Uh, Professor Oliver, and I'm Shnana. I am a student at Miranda House, and I'm also a in research intern with AAS. And my question is, what if China and its allies uh, adopt 5G? And you see the world is like more of a consumer world than a citizen of a nation. So consumers tend to adopt what is new in the market. And if 5G is once let out in few countries also, the whole world will be compared to utilize the 5G. And owing to the fact that Huawei is the only company that uh, provides 5G network, uh, wouldn't the whole world be compared to use 5G or provided by Huawei only? Right, so um, it's uh, it's really uh, interesting. I uh, I've had uh, over the past sort of months, you know, I've I've been reading 
uh, about 5G, uh, 5G technology. And again, you, 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 most of you, of course, are, are aware of that. But I think that uh, the, you know, the, the, the difference between 3G and 4G uh, is, is, is or, or 2G and 3G is, is, is really uh, much smaller than the, the transformation that we'll experience with the arrival of 5G because it, it, it has really the potential to transform uh, the economies and, and, uh, in, and basically serve as sort of the basis of, uh, of, of large parts of the global economy uh, in the next decades. Um, and I think it has become a bit of a proxy for, for superpowerdom. And as uh, Erdan Arikan, he's a, a Turkish engineer who, who played a key role in developing the uh, next generation technology of 5G, said, he said 5G is, is totally different. Uh, from the internet, he said, it's it's like a global nervous system, right? And um, in a way, uh, I think that uh, from a, an economic point of view, having a unified 5G network provided by you know the same standards, uh, similar companies, etc., uh, could actually make a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, from a geopolitical point of view, uh, countries will be very reluctant to allow um, one country alone to uh, take the lead and, 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 and you know, implement the construction of a globalized network um, because the kind of management that we've seen of the internet over the past 30 years uh, you know, was a, f a fairly uh, unusual way, right? Very much controlled by, by the United States. I think it's natural in a way that uh, countries like China or even others uh, will uh, prefer different models as we, uh, you know, um, take that next step. We're sort of still in the early uh, digital age, um, uh, so uh, so I think the the, uh, the the political concerns that will now emerge will cause a the, the rise of some sort of splinter net in which uh, governments play a, a much more uh, incisive role. Of uh, regulating, of uh, blocking content, in uh, controlling the flow of information, uh, which uh, is also a way to reassert the sovereignty, uh, because if, un if unregulated, you may ask the question of you know what's the future of the state uh, in uh, in a country uh, in, a, in a in a world in which technology companies make key decisions, and in a way, the past two weeks. Have given us a taste of what of the issues that will be uh, need to be discussed. Where an internet company uh, like Twitter uh, decides to uh, block the U.S. president, right, uh, for a lack of, of 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 regulation in the country, uh, which could have a decisive impact on on domestic politics. And I think if you apply that to to, to 5G in general. Uh, we get a sense of how uh, afraid I think governments will be to to to, to maintain control, um, and I think China has been in the lead. I think China has, has in, a, in a way, been more strategic than the United States, which lacks a company capable of competing with Huawei. Uh, but I do think that um, there is now a tremendous a tremendous effort, and one of the key aspects the Biden administration will pursue with the European Union and other countries like South Korea. Japan, India, etc., is to seek to articulate a joint response promoting specific companies that are more capable of competing with Huawei and be more engaged in the agenda setting, uh, and, and not the agenda setting, the standard setting, which will be crucial as this conflict evolves. Thank you to that. Let's go to Umar Bhadana. Is, uh also, someone who's raised her hand, please introduce yourself and ask your question or make your comment. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, the topic you discussed was like really very recent thing, and I really liked it. So my question is around. Oh, I, I think you you mute, you muted again. Uh, ah, now you're back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is related to the liberalization and information technology. So. Like for various reasons, we all admire liberalization. So my question is, uh, with the with the you know 
incoming information technology like in the liberalization we all talk about the freedom or free will you have to you have your own will to vote or you know to do your own things but with the advent of the technology that's coming i think our own uh, our own decisions will not be our own you know it will be more of like technology telling us to do all of these things so do you think in the, in the future upcoming future liberalization will lose its credibility because of the technology that's that's you know uh, kind of evolve in the upcoming years i hope yeah I that's a, yeah sorry excuse me did Go. you get my point yeah 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 it's uh, it's it's almost a, a philosophical uh, a question in a way right and uh, so to to what extent can uh, in a world full of uh, you know artificial intelligence doing the thinking for us and you know nudging us in specific directions uh uh not only based on you know probabilities of what's the next uh, song we'd like to hear on uh, spotify or you know which like which kind of movie you'd like to watch but also what kind of uh, news we would like to read uh, uh predicting uh, that in a sense and uh making happenstance uh much less uh, probable Uh, I remember, uh, you know, um, Svaran and 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 is is of of in that sense of of my generation. We we still the people who sometimes sort of wandered through a library and pulled out a book and another and, and sort of uh, kind of randomly in a way come across uh, new ideas that uh, you know no um, algorithm would have predicted, right? Because it's is you know you you sort of spend time and you you discover things. or you go to a bookstore and just look at stuff whereas at uh, Amazon or uh, uh, comparable platforms uh, you know there's you know, sort of guided in everything uh, and uh, I, again I, i think we're in this very incipient age now uh, where in retrospect i think for 20 years from now we will say this was kind of turbulent what we did because we allowed these technologies to emerge and have a massive impact on politics on human behavior and we hadn't the regulatory framework in place in order to 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 make sure that this was being done in a in a you know in the right way uh, so i think the this regulatory wave i think is coming now uh, it will have a cost for innovation no doubt uh, i think uh, you know there's a, a very interesting book by anu bradford uh, uh, it's called the brussels effect and she's written about uh, how the european union is uh, seeking to project itself as a regulatory power which uh, is uh, has the potential to impose rules only in europe but since the european market is so large tech companies around the world will basically adopt because it's just easier to do the european framework even if they operate outside of europe and um, and i think that uh, these are attempts to uh, rein in a bit uh, the uncontrolled development where again i think we've kind of uh, re- we've accepted that i think people tend to be very cavalier about privacy issues in brazil for example you know we have uh, you know people i don't know if it's in india but uh, whenever you know some new uh, user agreement pops up people just like scroll down and click accept because they're not patient Uh, I myself like that the other day on Twitter some some long text appeared are you do you agree with these new rules and I just wanted to tweet something so I just said okay I think that's um probably no longer be the case in in 10 20 years or most because people realize that you know they're giving away a lot of 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 aspects of their of, of their freedom in a sense uh which will uh, you know impact them so uh th- having said that There is of course just as a final point the uh, downside to that that authoritarian countries uh allow companies to uh, utilize the data provided by their users uh in a much freer way paradoxically uh because they're less concerned about privacy issues giving to some extent an advantage to company operating in a country like China uh whereas in uh, India or uh, in other democracies where you know privacy is is a concern Uh, these create some uh, restrictions uh, making it more difficult for example for a company to develop an algorithm in uh, france than in china 
And I think that's a big challenge that these regulators will have to, to, to manage is how to protect uh, uh, you know, fundamental rights without um, allowing authoritarian countries to, uh, to lead the race of technological development because it, there are freer spaces allowing uh, companies to harvest all the data that their users produce. Thank you. I'll invite next uh, Smita Singh. Please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and make your intervention. Okay. So, uh, my name is Smita Singh, and I'm working in the Parliamentary Committee on External Affairs. And I'm also a board member and an honorary researcher at the Security, Gender, and Development Institute. Thank you for uh, such an insightful talk on a very relevant uh, topic. I have two set of questions. One relate to India-Brazil bilateral relationship. And the second on the overall uh, cybersecurity architecture. So we do see India and Brazil share look at the world through you know similar lenses when it comes to multilateralism, climate change, democratization of the United Nations. But the response or uh, you know policy response have been diverging. How do you see this uh, divergent response, and uh, how has it impacted the ties between the two countries? And my second question pertains to the gap between realization that uh, ICTs have been playing a greater role in configuring the global order, while uh, there has been lack of a an, an, uh, mutually, you know, we can say an internationally agreed architecture on cyber issues. So how do you respond to such a mismatch? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so. I think that um, you know there have been these similarities between uh, India and uh, Brazil, which has allowed them to work together in uh, you know the G4, which has allowed them to uh, I think have very similar concerns uh, over the past when they uh, were part of the U UN Security Council. Uh, I remember, for example, the uh, debates about uh, R2P. Uh, and the Libya intervention uh, during that time, I think uh, Brazilian and, and uh, Indian foreign policymakers many times consulted. I think they together uh, uh, made it possible after the, the economic crisis to to achieve an adjustment of voting rights at the IMF. So there's a long list of of areas. Where there there's been an agreement, even sometimes, and this is really quite quite uh, interesting, when uh, the outcomes weren't fully ideal for both. Uh, you know, when we when I think back to to Cancun and the World Trade Organization uh, debates, uh, you know, Brazil really wanted uh, a deal, but in the end, in part because of you know southern solidarity, and you know, uh, it, it sided with with India. In, uh, in in uh, in stopping uh, a you know big ticket agreement back in the day, I think 2005 it was, uh, because it just didn't agree with the way that this was being done. It said you know we countries in the global south need a greater voice. So there's no no way around it. Uh, having said that, um, I think the uh, th there's also significant differences, and they're largely due to. Uh, very different uh, geopolitical environments in which uh, both countries operate. I've mentioned here the uh, Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, uh, which uh, Brazil is part of, but always kind of looked to India and said, mm, you know, this yeah, could have been us, uh, some people, but, you know, at the same time being very concerned in the, in the late 1990s that uh, not signing the NPT would make it more difficult for Brazil to uh, be seen as a good citizen. Uh, and also, it wasn't really, you know, there, there wasn't really such a, an existential threat compared to what uh, what India uh, was uh, was facing. Uh, and I also think that the uh, domestic uh, political uh, turbulences that emerged in Brazil after 2013 uh, made the urgency to look towards India, the urgency to to think constructively and innovatively about the. the you know, ways to cooperate uh, uh, less of <coughs> less less visible because there were so many immediate concerns, like the 
uh, refugee crisis in Venezuela uh, and, you know, uh, mass protests, um, you know, really a, a massive problem about, you know, organized crime, is, uh, which is, is, is a threat to the stability of, of, of countries in, in South America. So uh, I think that explains a bit why, you know, inhabiting these different worlds that generated a bit of, uh, of, of a divergence, which at, starting in a moment where internal challenges emerged in Brazil, uh, this kind of got derailed a bit, not because people are against India, but just because uh, those who were you know, promoting this debate always had to answer the question, which is like, uh, do we really need to you know, think hard about a place that's 20, Many hours away by by airplane, right? So why is this really so so essential? I think that's uh, something that uh, Brazil is still struggling with. The country that's not so sure if is it Western or not Western, sort of half Western. Uh, it's still very Eurocentric. Where you, you know the whole idea that we need to look towards Europe and and the United States is still deeply ingrained. And I, I paradoxically think it's one of the countries that will struggle most with the emergence of a post-Western world um, because it's also geographically distanced and uh, really going through a, a, a bit of a challenge there. Uh, regarding your, your, your second question, I think the... Um, there's, I mean, I, I really... And, and I don't want to take uh, that, that much time here. I just think that um, I continue to identify... Uh, somewhat uh, between policymakers, uh, at least in Brazil, um, a, bit of, a bit of the opinion that um, you know this isn't really that urgent to establish these structures uh, for us to advance decisively uh, in the attempt to govern and to create a set of rules and norms when it comes to global cyberspace. Uh, Brazil had a bit of that um, in 2015. It, uh, uh, it organized the, the Net Mundial, the Net Mundial Internet Summit. Uh, so it does have a lot of interest in these things and projected itself as you know uh, a, a country that could contribute on these issues. But it's a bit like studying Asia, I think, where once sort of trouble hits, you know, you you, you can no longer get to talk to a foreign, to a minister on the ministerial level when you talk about you know, these issues because they're not just seen as is sufficiently urgent, which I think is a massive mistake because they're important in the long term and you, you can't uh, put them off eternally. Uh, so I think uh, I, I have identified a bit of difficulties of really uh, getting the key stakeholders uh, who say, you know, we must really focus on this even in a bilateral visit. We must push this on the multilateral base uh, uh, platforms. Uh, and, and I think that's a worrisome trend. And I think that sometimes, uh, you know, I, I sometimes think a big event must happen, be it some massive global outage or something like that, where countries wake up and say, we really need to sit together and work on a functioning framework for these issues. And raised hand successfully. Let us see if his internet will help, help us now. Rakesh, if you're able to hear me, can you unmute yourself and ask your question and I will translate your question. I can hear you, please. Sir, my name is Rakesh Kumar. I am a Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Orla Nehru University, PhD. मैं सर छोटा सा जानकारी पूछना चाह रहा था सर से ओलिवर स्टुंकल सर से इनकी बुक मैंने पढ़ी थी पोस्ट वेस्टर्न वर्ल्ड बहुत अच्छी लगी मुझे पढ़ के मून वेस्टर्न पर्सपेक्टिव ऑफ इंटरनेशनल रिलेशंस सर मैं ये पूछना चाह रहा था कि जो इंडिया भी यूएनएससी का नॉन परमानेंट मेंबर बना है अभी तो इंडिया और ब्राजील आपस में मिलके कैसे परमानेंट सीट के लिए मतलब एक यूएनएससी के अंदर लोग भी तैयार कर सकते हैं कुछ उसके बारे में कुछ आइडिया बता सकते हैं सर मैं मैं आपका सवाल अभी आई विल ट्रांसलेट योर क्वेश्चन फर्स्ट ऑफ़ ऑल ही इज इंट्रोड्यूस हिमसेल्फ ही इज डूइंग पीएचडी एट स्कूल ऑफ इंटरनेशनल स्टडीज इन द हरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी 
the book that he put on the banner, the post-Western world. And he said he has learned a good deal from after reading that book of yours. And the question he has uh, is to go back to the four nation group that was trying to, you know, obtain permanent seat on the UN Security Council. And India, Brazil were in that group at that time. So uh, is there a likelihood since India has just rejoined as a non-permanent member from 1st of January, would that bring the focus back in India, Brazil, Arles uh, to try again to find some methodology of, uh, you know, Reformation of UN Security Council and the permanent seat for Brazil and India on UNSC. Well, uh, I think uh, the uh, the high point uh, was in uh, 2005 when uh, we were relatively close to uh, an agreement. But right now, the problem is that I think Russia and China uh, are just unwilling to uh, to advance because you need the support of the permanent members. So I sometimes fear that uh, the likelihood of this, you know, being a possibility are quite slim right now, uh, because perhaps the combination of countries, uh, you know, generates just too broad of an opposition. Uh, opposition by the Chinese, and opposition by, you know, Pakistan, by uh, Italy, which doesn't want Germany in, by Argentina. Uh, so I am quite skeptical at this stage that, um, you know, we'll, we'll see uh, a reform in the next couple of years. But I think it remains useful to continue to mention the necessity of making the UN Security Council more representative. Uh, so it's a bit of those things where you just need to keep sort of bringing things up, uh, not necessarily because they will have an immediate impact, but but because it's just the right thing to do. Uh, and I'm I'm very happy to to see India, uh, you know, as a non permanent member. Um, but again, I, I I find it relatively unlikely that we'll see immediate change in the near term. Thank you. Uh, so Rakesh. Uh... आप समझ गए होंगे ज्यादातर तो क्या उन्होंने आपका प्रश्न का उत्तर दिया है तो उनको अभी नहीं लगता कि यह विषय बहुत अहम है और बहुत जल्द से यह ध्यान इस पर केंद्रित होने वाला है तो उनका अपना विश्लेषण ऐसा है इसको लेकर मीनवाइल आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर सिल्की कॉर टू अनम्यूट एंड आस्क योर क्वेश्चन गुड इवनिंग सर हाउ आर यू Thank you, sir, for your very informative talk. And as you have a profound expertise on BRICS, my question is that as the five countries of BRICS are not homogeneous in interest, values, and policy preferences, so do they all have a common interest in checking U.S. and Western power and influence? What is your take on this, sir? Thank you, sir. You you mean uh, you mean. Uh, uh... Countries like um, Brazil, and India, or yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I, uh, I think the uh, there there is certainly, and this was quite interesting in in both India. I would probably think, but in in, in Brazil, when the Cold War was over. There wasn't really celebration, not because you know Brazilians had any sympathy for for the Soviet Union, but because there was a bit of a concern that a unipolar order would be would make it more difficult for Brazil to maintain its autonomy, to maintain its space for you know strategic uh, maneuvering and defend its interests in a world where there were few uh, constraints on you know. United States on the United States engagement acting as a unipolar power, uh, and I think now um, as we are entering a period of either mul- uh, bipolarity or multipolarity, I think the period of bipolarity will be, if we describe it as such, uh, could be relatively short uh, before we head into some uh, multipolarity of not only the United States and China but also. 
uh, uh, India and the EU. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, that will, oh, sorry, just, um, I think the, uh, that will make the concern of India and Brazil sort of less about constraining the United States alone, uh, but now transform it into something more about uh, uh, about navigating uh, great power competition. Uh, so at least from sort of my perception, I don't think there's a genuine disagreement where sort of, you know, if you have a valued difference where you say, you know, the United States defends X, we defend Y, but much more geopolitical concern of uh, constraining uh, the exercise of power by specific actors. Uh, I do think, actually, you know, uh, Brazil is, is interesting. Uh, when, whenever we hear U.S. foreign policymakers, they come down to Brazil and say, oh, you know, we're a democracy, you're a democracy, we must fight the Chinese autocrat. And it's, it doesn't sort of, it sounds strange from a Brazilian perspective, not because we are not really uh, supportive of our own democracy, but, but because the, uh, in, in, in Brazil's view, the idea that Brazil is a democracy doesn't provide it with that same mission to go out and say everybody must adopt our political system. So there's a bit of an uneasiness about this, uh, the, you know, the, 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 um, what's between the lines of this rhetoric. So when uh, uh, back in the day, I think uh, there was an attempt uh, 20 years ago, uh, Madeleine Albright, was thinking about a league of democracies. And Brazil is, you know, I think a very uh, profoundly democratic society, but it's, um, it's, it didn't like the idea, and I understand why. It, it generated discomfort because it was, it was uh, running up against another basic principle, that of, of, of sovereignty. And, uh, you know, we've had a recent experience of, uh, of fairly recent, until the 80s, of being a dictatorship. And that was also, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, influence and foreign influence. So I think that, um, that there's a lot of agreement with, uh, you know, uh, Western concepts and ideas and leadership uh, uh, between Brazil and, you know, the West. But at the same time, I think somewhat different notions of, uh, of how to, you know, structure international order. And of what role these values should play as we as we build the international system. Thank you. Le also, um, very happy to uh, reply any uh, or to, on our part, uh, to to respond to any uh, messages or you know this is a terrific opportunity. I'm learning so much also. So let let me quickly ask you some very short question. I think the name of Jack Ma has not appeared so far in our discussion, who's revolutionizing uh, technology regulation since last October. He has brought regulation of technology in China and big debate. Uh, but, you know, this whole talk about building the wall with Mexico and uh, four years of uh, President Trump, you mentioned the increasing skepticism vis-a-vis -vis United States in engaging in technology transfers and that benefits China and China's increasing footprint in Latin America and Caribbean areas. Uh, are you expecting some change? Uh, you know, it's also important day. I'm sure Joe Biden is already dressing up, putting on his necktie right now, you know, to get ready for his swearing and ceremony, which again is an interesting, you know, situation in Washington, D.C. that we are watching on television. So do you see some change, disadvantage China coming up in coming years uh, because of different engagement that Joe Biden might offer in technology transfers? I think that uh, there has been, to my mind, a change in the way that Washington as a whole thinks about these things. So I don't expect there to be a fundamental difference in the way that, you know, between Trump and Biden. Um, when, when I remember when I started talking to policymakers about these things, and they, they were still sort of, you know, a lot of, I, I wouldn't say misguided, but, you know, thinking there was very much influenced by sort of the Eikenberry uh, uh, way of, of, of uh, 
you know, believing that China could be integrated into this uh, order, etc. And, you know, the, there were some China hawks, but they were still sort of the minority. But, but I think that changed uh, over the la past, like, five years or so. So I think um, the... Um, uh, I, I don't see there to be a massive change. I think the cosmetics will change. I think, you know, they will stop, you know, building a wall. They will stop to, you know, he will, Biden will not conduct his policy via Twitter. Uh, but I think the essence, and I've seen that here, I, I, you know, with you know, the incoming people from the Biden administration, that the pressure, for example, on Brazil not to use Huawei will be essentially the same. Uh, I think the, the approach, you know, maybe more multilateral, seeking to mobilize allies, but the essence, I think, is more structural than related to, to who's in the White House. Thank you. I think the candidate has communicated that some audio issue is today with her internet, so we'll have to miss uh, listening to her comment or question now. And with that, I think we had a, a very large number of questions. Uh, Vikya, we will come to you next time now. I think unless you have some related question to ask, okay, we can give you a chance. We shouldn't let you go. Feeling we didn't allow you to ask another question. So very quickly. I think you can you to unmute, unmute yourself. So what I was saying that if we are running out of time, then it's fine. No, no, you can quickly squeeze in your question. I'm sure we can take it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so Oliver, so my question was: so, say, if India becomes permanent member of the United United Nations tomorrow, then how it will have? Uh, uh, so, my question is: how Brazil can take benefit from India of normalizing their relations with USA? As in this past four years of Trump's Trump's regime, the relations have not been so good of USA and Brazil. Okay, we got that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I think that uh, it's really, we have to wait and see sort of what happens now. I think uh, there have been very close ties between uh, uh, Brazil and uh, the United States over the past two years because the, it's, the two presidents are very similar. Now there seems to be a bit of a rupture. Uh, I think India will probably handle these things quite well, uh, but also because it knows how to project itself as a, as a very useful U.S. ally. So my, my doubt a bit is whether, the United, whether Brazil wants to have a productive relationship with the United States right now, because I feel like the president, uh, Brazil's president, is utilizing tensions with Biden and, as a way to mobilize his supporters. By sort of saying, oh, you know, the globalists, etc., the White House, they try to undermine Brazilian sovereignty. So I am skeptical that the government is sort of interested, unfortunately, in, in learning from India. Uh, uh, let's see. I think this is something we'll have to follow over the next weeks and to see the, uh, the, the willingness of the Brazilian government to be pragmatic, which I fear is uh, is not very big, but uh, but let's see. I think it's a different scenario now that Brazil has lost its major ally. So perhaps there there is a, a way forward there. Yes, you did mention you, earlier that you were skeptical about this permanent membership issue even coming to the table. And of course, yeah. uh, Bolsonaro has been Trump's candidate <laughs> very clearly. That again was something which is uh, well known between US and Brazil, and now, of course, the challenges could emerge. Uh, so, I think we had a good discussion. A large number of questions came up, and uh, Professor Stwinkel uh, very patiently, in detail, answered each of the questions, which is the motive of our discussion so that each participant, if he or she has a comment or question, should get a full 100% attention, which very sincerely, the speaker of the day provided to each of the participants who made a comment or asked a question. So sincere thanks for that. But for the formal, <coughs> for the formal vote of thanks, I will invite my colleague Professor Ina Marva to uh, also make concluding remarks and propose vote of thanks. Um, thank you so much. Uh, 
Professor Oliver, really, it's been a delight uh, to listen to you. Very, very interesting, right from the start to the end, you know, and the range of questions. I think we've never had any speaker be subjected to this kind of range of questioning, you know, from IMSA to the South China Sea to the technology wars. And of course, I think this is also an area which you must continue to work in. And we really wish you good luck. And we all want to read more and more of your work because this is a challenge which all of us, you know, uh, would need to surmount. Of course, we do know that along with Huawei, as uh, Professor Swaran mentioned in the beginning, that there are other tech giants as well. And we cannot uh, forget uh, Ericsson and Nokia, which are also uh, developing their 5G networks. And so we really have to see, you know, that how this um, new Cold War and, uh, you know, how countries are going to negotiate their way uh, forward and get linked or inked to different pacts uh, with, the, you know, the major powers. And you also looked at uh, the, the entire uh, footprint of China and the economic engagement, uh, the issues, bilateral issues, both uh, with China as well as with the United States. So really, thank you so much. You've not only been patient, you answered, responded to each question by our participants in such great detail to their complete satisfaction. We are completely uh, beholden to you and really thank you uh, for your very, very valuable time and for, in, you know, sort of uh, engaging with us uh, for two hours, one of our longest um, <laughs> webinars. And we do hope that, you know, somehow we could bring you to our conference on multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific because really uh, you would be able to give us, again, new and fresher insights in the next three months. And um, so after two weeks, a fortnight later, uh, we would have our next uh, webinar again in the evening. That is on 3rd of February. And our speaker is Professor Anna Suvarova. And the title of the talk is very different. So now we come back uh, to South Asia. Uh, Widows and Daughters, Role of Women Leaders in South Asia. So 5.30, 3rd of February, looking forward to seeing you all. And thank you very much once again. Thank you, Professor Oliver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank to you so much also for your time. And thank you to our team for being there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Oliver, thank for you very much. the detailed, exhaustive lecture today. And uh, hoping that we will get to meet each other face to face. Uh, we get to see you here in Delhi sometime within this year. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.